It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 22. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and we take a look at the headlines in creationism from this past week. This week we have soft tissue fossils, mutations not random, sloth migration, and look at mediated design. All that coming up. Okay, let's get right to it. Last week, I it was a little bit, it was a boring week in creationism. It really was. I didn't really have a whole lot to say, and there weren't very many interesting articles. Well, this week, you can see um, I got a little more energy because it was a really interesting week in creationism. A bunch of really interesting stuff came out, and I'm going to share three different stories that I've picked out. Uh, but before I get to those, uh, I'm actually going to go back a little bit. I was scanning the ICR, Institute for Creation Research, uh, Twitter feed and came across this particular meme. And it's very relevant to some things that ICR has been talking about for the last year. Uh, and even in the last week, they have published an article about uh, preservation of soft tissues. And this is, this is their big baby, right? This is one of their... Uh, they're, they're big stories that they're pushing constantly because to them, this is one of the clearest evidences to, to their audience uh, of young earth creationists that the world must be young. Because after all, how could soft tissues uh, survive for millions upon millions of years? And so you get tweets like this and articles that suggest uh, this sort of language, right? Scientists have discovered mummified dinosaur skin dinosaur blood hemoglobin, dried up eyeball retinas from a mosasaur, right? If you were a typical non-scientist reading just these words, what would, you, what would you in your mind imagine is being talked about, right? You'd imagine dinosaur skin that was mummified, dried up, and you're finding this dried up skin. Or blood hemoglobin, right? That, that, that there's actual dinosaur blood that has been found uh, in fossils. And how could, how could blood last for millions of years? Or dried up eyeball retinas? I mean, an eyeball retina is a pretty sensitive thing. And if we found a dried eyeball retina that was in a 60, 80 million year old dinosaur, or the, I'm sorry, not a dinosaur, a mosasaur. Remember, mosasaurs, sea reptiles, different group of uh, reptiles. You'd be forgiven for thinking and imagining that the fossil record is full of these um, remains of soft tissues, as if it just died recently and um, there it is, right? These are just the, the decay products of things that have been sitting around for a little bit, little while. So I get, uh, I get a, a tinge bit upset, all right, when I, when I see things like this, because this is a very inaccurate um, uh, communication of the science of the fossils that are actually found. So I want to talk about two of these very briefly just to give an example of what I think is a, you know, at, at best, it would be, it's the result of the ignorance of scientists at Institute for Creation Research, uh, just not knowing better and understanding the, the literature. Or uh, at worst, it's just outright lying about uh, the fossils. Um, and I'll leave you to, to judge. So I want to look at that last one about mosasaurs, and that actually comes from this particular. So I went and looked up the, the article related to the preservation of dried up retinas. It comes from this paper, Convergent Evolution in Aquatic Tetrapods, Insights from an Exceptional uh, Fossil Mosasaur. Uh, this is from uh, 2010. And in this paper, they describe the fossil, and it's an amazing fossil. Uh, let's get right to the important the important question. What does it mean that there are dried up retinas in this mosasaur? All right, here's the picture. Um, this is what they found. So here here is the here's the eyeball, which is uh, very very large in a mosasaur. Uh, and inside this mosasaur, you have this uh, this is this is rock. Okay, this is not soft tissue, um, and so. But what they're claiming is that there are things in this rock, all right, that are preserved remnants of the retina of a mosasaur. And that thing that's preserved from the mosasaur's eyes in the retina is something called melanosome. So in this picture, D, this is a very close-up image because these are only about two micrometers long. Are these structures called melanosomes? 
that are produced inside of organelles, inside of cells. And these structures are involved in the refraction of light, which then gives off, the refraction gives off, uh, creates the coloration. Uh, these are found in the feathers of, of um, birds, uh, and so create a variety of different kinds, especially iridoid uh, type birds. These are found in the feathers of birds, giving off, creating several of the different coloration patterns in birds. They're also found in skin in a variety of different animals, uh, and it's thought, and it's been found in the skin of dinosaurs. And this is one of the reasons why your coloring books and your your uh, your movies that show dinosaurs show much more colorful dinosaurs now, because in the fossil record we're able to interpret these melanosomes based on the shape of the melanosome. Uh, it determines the type of color um, that it produced. Produced, it's not emanating color, it's reflecting color. Uh, and so, uh, you know, let me read the text over here. This purplish matter in the sclerotic ring aperture may represent retinas, all right, or remnants of the retina, as this tissue is presumably pressed down against the inner surface of the underlying scleral ossicles when the head collapsed during the decay of the carcass. This interpretation is corroborated by the presence of loosely packed aligned bodies, and that's, that's why they, they, they align these little columns, um, called melanosomes that are only two micrometers long. Well, you know that melanosomes, uh, their molecular composition is such that there's nothing surprising about them surviving for tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. Uh, they're a very stable molecule. Uh, and so this is what's left of the retina. They're saying that the reason we think that there's remains of a retina is that we have found these melanosomes, which are the only part of the retina that hasn't completely decayed and been replaced right, by other things. It's still the original melanosomes uh, from, the let, from the retina. So that's, that's a really cool find uh, and um, allows them to, tell, to potentially tell them something about uh, the reflectivity in the back of the eye of a mosasaur. And so really cool, but has nothing to do, and, and it does not substantiate the claim of ICR at all, certainly doesn't substantiate the claim that they're trying to um, get their audience to think, right? Because looking at that dried up retina, I'm thinking that's, uh, you know, I'm gonna find a piece of retina there that's a, that it is, hasn't decayed yet and is somehow preserved uh, from that uh, mosasaur. So this is, Totally false advertising. Uh, second point, uh, dinosaur blood hemoglobin, right? Have we found dino blood? And I've covered this in the past, uh, but this claim comes from a couple different places where dino blood has been found, but I'm pretty sure that this particular one about dinosaur hemoglobin comes from an article from ICR in which they talk about this, uh, this mosquito that was found in the fossil record, in which from the abdomen of this mosquito, they extracted and discovered inside the abdomen evidence that it had blood in the abdomen. And it was like, okay, we can show that mosquitoes from long ago actually drank blood of other animals. Uh, but you're thinking, okay, so they found blood in there. No, they didn't really find blood in there. Did they find hemoglobin, which is a protein that's found in blood? No, they didn't even find hemoglobin in there. What they found was the degraded remains of hemoglobin, which is the heme molecule. And they didn't even find the heme molecule. They found a, a chemically degraded version of heme uh, molecules called this heme product which they can infer back was probably heme, and that heme would have been inside of, or, can, or part of a hemoglobin uh, macromolecule, right? So hemoglobin is this really large, complex protein made up of amino acids, right? And it combines with these heme molecules in which there is this iron uh, atom, and that's what's going to attract the oxygen, carries the oxygen in your blood. Uh, so the heme itself is only just one part of the hemoglobin molecule. Now, what happens uh, after you know, the organism dies is you have protein decay, and all of the protein disappears because the amino acids aren't nearly as stable as the heme molecule. And even the heme molecule itself isn't completely stable over time. It experiences chemical degradation. 
and it degrades into something called this heme product. And you can see that it's lost its uh, hydroxyl and oxygen uh, side arms, and it has a bunch of new double bonds. So it's a very stable molecule. How stable is this molecule? Uh, this molecule can last for tens and hundreds of millions of years in this particular form if it's in a, in a location like inside of a fossil where it's not experiencing a lot of other interactions. Um, oil contains a lot of porphyrins and uh, heme, the heme molecule is a type of porphyrin. All right, there's a bunch of different variations on this molecule, uh, but it's found in a lot of other preserved uh, places in the fossil record. So what was found there is not dinosaur blood hemoglobin, right? That's, that's a lie. Hemoglobin was not found. What was found is evidence that hemoglobin could have been there. The protein could have been there because there is heme there, a breakdown product of heme, a porphyrin found in the abdomen of that mosquito. And that is inferred as evidence that there was hemoglobin there. Right. So but the message of ICR and other creationists who want to use uh, soft tissues uh, as evidence of a young earth are planting the idea in their their followers minds that they're finding these complete intact proteins and molecules just as they were in the living organism. And that's just not the case. They're degraded into stable molecules and once they reach that which they reach some point of stability they can then last for long periods of time right this hemoglobin might have decayed in a day a month a year five years a hundred years but at some point it reaches the point where it's that heme product and then it's sort of like okay i can just stay this way for tens of millions of years it's not an evidence for a young earth and honestly it's just it's deceptive it's just outright deceptive um, to use words like dinosaur skin, blood hemoglobin, and dried up eyeball retinas when you know that your audience is not going to understand what I just described in terms of what was actually found. Because once you discover what they found, it doesn't seem significant anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like uh, something that is going to convince you that the earth is young. All right, we have to move on. Let's go to answers in Genesis. Um, article about slow moving animal dispersion after the flood. You know, a perennial question for young earth creationists is after the animals departed from the ark, how did they get to their present day locations? And uh, kangaroos have been a, a popular one to talk about. I've talked about lemurs recently um, and of course sloths, right? I mean, sloths are these really slow moving creatures and they only live in South America. And South America is a long way um, from the Middle East. And yet in the young earth model of earth's history, all sloths had to have been in the Middle East at some point or the general region of the Middle East and then made their way all the way to South America not leaving any uh, you know, ancestors behind because we have no fossil record of sloths outside of South America, uh, well, and a little bit of North America. All right, so they're addressing that. And this is kind of the typical stuff, but I thought there was a couple passages in here that would be worth reading uh, because it, it, it's informative as to their general mindset about how change happens after, uh, after the flood. So speciation mechanisms. Right? And we have to remember this comes from Answers in Genesis, which has a different view of speciation mechanisms than ICR. Created heterozygosity lends itself well to providentially allowing animals to diversify in various conditions. It's shaped by natural selection, genetic drift, founder effect, geographical and genetic isolation, climate factors, etc. In other words, all the mechanisms of evolutionary biology. While these factors are in play today, the selective pressure is nowhere near as great in most animals as it was at the time of the early post-flood period. Yeah, so I don't know how they quantify that, but I guess they're saying after the animals got off the ark, it was a chaotic world, right? Crazy stuff is still happening. The plants hadn't grown back and, um, you know, animals hadn't really found their niches. They hadn't really adapted to the new environment after that. And so the suggestion here is that all these effects of natural selection, genetic drift and so forth, were sort of like 
um, accentuated at that time, causing faster a faster pace of speciation and change to these organisms. And remember, they need that because they're saying two individuals got off the ark and became dozens of species. Uh, and how did that happen? Uh, it must have happened really fast. So maybe things were just really different then. But they're still invoking, I'll say, natural processes, right? They're invoking all of the typical mechanisms of evolutionary, the, the typical evolutionary mechanisms, although at some sort of heightened or elevated pace. Um, and they're also invoking a bottleneck, right? Because mostly because the bottleneck that occurred at that time, right? That's, well, there are only a few animals. And so that creates uh, uh, various genetic effects. Um, even recently, evolutionary biologists have discovered one, of the, one that most species ap appear to have a recent origin. Now, I didn't even have to click that link to know what they were talking about here. And I want to tell you what they're talking about when they say recent origin. Because this is another case where the typical young earth creationist reader reads through a paragraph like this and says, oh, look, even evolutionary biologists have discovered that most species appear to have a recent origin. And what to you does recent mean? The implication, right, in this paragraph is that recent is thousands of years, kind of like, hey, more like the young earth model versus an ancient earth model. I happen to know that, uh, and I clicked on this to, to discover exactly what I expected to find, uh, which is a link to another article that talks about a, a, a journal paper that I have read. And recent for those authors meant 100,000 to 200,000 years. To say that most species on Earth um, have a genetic common ancestor within the last 100 to 200,000 years. I've interacted with one of the authors on that paper after that paper got, came out because it had been picked up by young Earth creationists as being supportive of their view of recent speciation and uh, asked them a bunch of questions about how this fit with their model. And I can tell you they were, <laughs> the author was very clear that, uh, that young earth creationists completely have misconstrued uh, this particular article. Uh, it was based on mitochondrial uh, DNA studies and the variation found in mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and that's not reflective of the age of a species it's just reflective of how old the species is in terms of the present population. Like of the present population, um, how, far, how far can you trace back the genetics in that, in that present population? Most populations, the genetic variation in the present population can be traced back 100 to 200,000 years, but that doesn't mean the species isn't a lot older that for reasons I'm not gonna go into here, but I just wanna let you know that um, that recent here isn't as recent as, as some people might think they're meaning. And even if they think 100 to 200,000 years doesn't sound very old, that's just the lower limit, all right, of, of how old species are. Uh, species can be far older than that. It doesn't restrict them uh, from being older. Okay, but I've talked about that elsewhere as well. So how did sloths get to where they are? All right, so it's a, it's a combination of two possibilities. Uh, and these are the same explanations that are used for virtually all the animals on Earth uh, that are anywhere outside of Asia and the Middle East and Africa and Europe. Um, but like land bridges, which came uh, in the post-flood world, the floating mats of vegetation would have had a limited window of opportunity. All right, they're referring to the first explanation is during the ice age that occurred a couple hundred years after the flood, the water was lower. There were places where animals could walk from Siberia over to Alaska. And then so what could have happened is a sloth got off the ark, a pair of sloths got off the ark, and they traveled all the way through Asia up to Siberia, across that land bridge into Alaska, and then down all the way down into South America, um, and then began to speciate there into dozens of different species. Um, that we uh, have, well, that are extinct species and living species today. But then they suggest another possibility. They suggest that there were floating mats of vegetation. So this flood that ripped up all the forests of the, of the pre-flood world, some of those forests would still have been kind of floating as debris mats on the ocean. 
surface. So how could they have gotten there? Well, they could have gotten there by simply hopping on one of these mats and then floating across the ocean. And so they show uh, a map. Um, yeah, so they have this, uh, hey, they could have uh, they could have just floated all the way down here to, to South America on these vegetation mats. Uh, similar to similar to kangaroos, because kangaroos couldn't necessarily hop all the way to, to Australia. They would have, to have hopped onto a vegetation map and then hopped off there. Um, all right, so there it is. But as I've I've spoken about before, there's there's another problem. Um, even if even if you could imagine a scenario where that happens to one individual or two individuals, um, there's think about kangaroos. There's or marsupials. I mean, Australia has. 25 different kinds of marsupials that Answers in Genesis recognize as different kinds um, and no placentals on the continent. And so what they're really proposing is, is that 25 different pairs of marsupials got off the ark, traveled across Africa or traveled across um, or traveled at least down to the end of the Red Sea and then jumped on a, on a vegetation map, but all 20 representatives of 20 different kinds of marsupials all had to join up together, right? Or get on 20 different vegetation maps, and they all ended up in Australia to the exclusion of all placentals. But, I mean, but what about mice? What about, there's a, there's a lot of different placental mammals that you could imagine surviving on a vegetation map just as easily, if not more easily, and surviving a, you know, multi-thousand mile tra trip across an ocean and then coming to the shores of Australia. So the, the exclusive mix of marsupials that's only found in Australia is more than just a problem of how did marsupials get there? It's how did only marsupials get there and how did multiple different kinds of marsupials that are in for creationists not related to one another, get there after getting off the ark. It's it's a it's a it's a monumental, you know, statistical problem uh, for them. That this kind of signage and these kind of messages don't really address. They kind of give these ad hoc. Uh, let's not actually get into the details and try to see how probable this is because once you start calculating the probabilities, it's. Uh, it, you, you start to realize how uh, vanishingly small the chances are of this happening. All right, moving on. Story number three, or let's say article number three. Back to Institute for Creation Research, but uh, not only Institute for Creation Research, but Answers in Genesis has, uh, I think they've already responded to this, this news article, and I'm sure creation.com or uh, CMI will also respond to it because it's, it's a big story. Um, there was a, a, a recent publication, which I'm going to show you, that suggests that, um, that mutations aren't completely random in the genome. And uh, that might sound surprising. I didn't find it surprising at all. I mean, we've, we've known that different portions of the genome uh, mutate at different rates. Uh, and so I didn't find this shocking. I found it really fascinating, actually. Uh, but, but there's been a study that has quantified uh, mutations in different regions and different portions of the genome much better than has been in the past to show this discrepancy. So here's this article, Random Mutations Debunked by Secular Scientists. And this article by Jeffrey Tompkins starts out with uh, what you would expect. A fundamental axiom of evolutionary theory is the alleged random appearance of mutations. Now, of course, they're going to say, see, it was alleged, and they were wrong, um, of an organism. And then I've highlighted this next line. This supposedly creates novel genetic variation for the mystical agent called natural selection. Uh, see, mystical agent? Uh, um, if, if you've heard my stuff at all, you, you'll know that I spend a lot of time talking about the... Um, the separation of answers in Genesis and, and uh, Institute for Creation Research on their views of natural selection. Uh, and so here they're using the pejorative <laughs> statement, mystical agent called natural selection. 
because ICR doesn't believe that natural selection is a thing. Uh, whereas Answers in Genesis, we just read another little bit of an article from Answers in Genesis that referred to how does speciation happen through natural selection, you know, after the flood. And so this is, this is a very different view that ICR is promoting here. And then there's a, that essential premise has now been utterly debunked in this new research uh, paper. All right. First of all, this isn't uh, this is this paper is interesting uh, and important, but it's not shockingly new information, and it's something we've already known about before, and it doesn't utterly debunk uh, the premise of random appearance of mutations because mutations are still considered to be random in different portions of the genome. It's a matter of in some sections of the genome, they're more likely to occur than other sections of the genome. And natural selection might actually be influencing the evolution of how frequently mutations occur in different ports of, portions of the genome. It's really cool stuff. Uh, here's the article. Mutation bias reflects natural selection in Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is a, uh, a well-studied plant, type of mustard. Uh, and this group of scientists uh, published um, Monroe et al. in um, the journal Nature, uh, a, a big journal. And let me hit a couple highlights here from this article. Our findings reveal adaptive mutation bias that is mediated between a link between mutation and the epigenome. So. Um, Adaptive mutation bias. But mutation bias would be just the observation that uh, one portion of, of the DNA code uh, experiences, say, a greater rate of mutations over time versus another segment of, of DNA. And this is, you know, this has been widely observed uh, over and over and over again. It's easy to explain in the sense that, like, a coding gene that codes for a really important function is not going to accumulate mutations very quickly over time because they can't afford to change very much, whereas a portion of DNA code that isn't expressed as a gene can handle a lot more mutations. But then there's a the question of how many mutations actually occur in that region, not just how many survive to the next generation. And maybe it is that mutations can occur more frequently at some locations in a genome than others. And so it's not completely random across the genome. Um, and that's what they're looking at. Hypomutation uh, targeted to features enriched in, in functional constrained loci. So hypomutation would be lower numbers of mutations. So actually lowering the number of mutations that occur. They're still occurring potentially randomly within that segment. So you have like, let's say you have 500 base pairs of DNA uh, and you're saying the organism potentially can lower the overall number of mutations happening there. It's not, this article isn't really saying that they can, that an organism controls um, where each individual mutation occurs. You said among these 500 base pairs, I'm gonna lower the rate such that there's only three random mutations every 10 generations somewhere in those 500 base pairs. But outside of that, in the next 1,000 base pairs, uh, outside this gene, um, for the same amount of space, again, let's say 500 base pairs, there can be 20 mutations over the next three or 10 generations. Um, and again, I'm not gonna predict exactly where they are because there are random mutations occurring, that's just they're not occurring at the same pace. Um, and so when you look across the genome, it's not random, is it? Right In that sense, in each individual zone, the mutations might be random, but across the genome, more mutations are happening in one area than they are in another area. So it's not completely random as to where mutations occur in terms of the rates of mutations. Um, they go on to say, this intuitive model fits established theory, showing that adaptive mutation bias could evolve despite drift and so forth. All right, so there's a bunch of technical language here. But they're saying that their model fits established theory. All right, well, what's established theory? Established theory of, of, of molecular mechanisms of evolution. 
which that ICR article tried to say, complete this article completely debunks the idea of, of random mutations. They're saying, nope, this, can, this fits the established theory when you consider these different, uh, different competing forces that are occurring. Conclusion, while it may be important to test the degree and extent of mutation bias beyond Arabidopsis, so they're only finding this in this particular plant, the adaptive mutation bias described here provides an alternative explanation for many previously ob observations in eukaryotes. And they're saying, you've observed, people have observed this pattern across a lot of different eukaryotic genomes, and possibly the mechanisms that we're talking about could explain the patterns there as well. And so this is a widespread phenomena of organisms actually having some control through a mechanism of evolution to turn up and turn down mutation rates in different portions of their genome. And that's really interesting. Um, see here, it said since mutational biases are a product of evolution, they could differ between organisms. One organism might have higher mutation rates than another organism. And that again would explain the pace potentially of how quickly organisms can adapt versus another, how fast one species might adapt to an environment versus another one. So this is a, I'm going to say it's a, it's a really interesting article. I think it's, it's important. It's not overthrowing some established dogma in the way that uh, Institute for Creation Research and the other creationist organizations are, are going to suggest. Um, and I just, I'll just uh, toss in one other little thing. I just did a really quick search on to, to see if other people have noticed different rates of mutations, uh, and spontaneous or random mutations. And here's another article just from the previous year in uh, genome research, temperature dependence of spontaneous mutation rates. This is, they show that uh, they took the same organisms and they grew them under different temperatures in order to test and then looked at their genomes over generations to see where they accumulated mutations and how fast they accumulated mutations. And not surprisingly, the mutation rate was temperature dependent, right? Wasn't uh, completely, you know, mutation rate wasn't completely random. It is controlled by temperature. If it can be controlled by temperature, well then mutation rate can be controlled by other factors that maybe an organism actually has control over uh, in terms of how it controls the uh, its DNA and replication process. And so higher temp, in this case, if you push something to very high temperatures or very low temperatures, you increase the number of mutations. And so there's sort of a sweet spot in terms of the environmental uh, range in which an organism has the lowest mutation rates. All right, so that's mutation rates and um, uh, randomness, which is a very hard concept to to grasp because it means so many different things at different levels within organisms. All right, last up, we go to New Creation uh, blog, sponsored by the Is, Is Genesis History. And we look at this um, article by Ken Colson. I, I always enjoy Ken Colson articles. I mean, they're so insightful. He really sees the big picture in creationism and kind of hones in on like, what are the central issues here? And sees the the nuances of different viewpoints out there. And, and I, I think just brings them all together in a nice clean package. So I'm actually gonna read most of this article. It's a short article, Mediated Design versus Microevolution, right? So just from the title you can see is he's suggesting that there's something other than microevolution. Remember microevolution is code word for um, speciation and speci uh, uh, well, it's code word for evolutionary biology for uh, young earth creationists, right? In the answers in Genesis model, natural selection, genetic drift, all these different forces that are creating new species after the flood, they consider that not macroevolution, but they consider it microevolution. So now what is this other thing? Mediated design. Is that a, a different force that's involved in creating biological diversity? Uh, and of course, what really caught my eye was going to, he's going to talk about bombardier beetles a little bit, which I've just talked about uh, in my previous video. Um, so here's some highlights. Uh, it starts right out with uh, talking about this false dichotomy that creationists have, all right? 
or many Christians, but he's really, he's, I think, mostly talking about mostly talking about young earth creationists, but I, I could see where this might apply to all Christians as well. Many Christians believe in a false dichotomy that exalts the supernatural over the natural. Most organisms, most organs and or organisms, for example, are seen as products of a historical supernatural design conceptualized during creation week. I think that's fair to say. I think most young earth creationists and many just Christians in general uh, see everything, uh, all the organisms around us as this uh, supernatural design just made in the creation week. Adaptations resulting from secondary microevolutionary processes, on the other hand, although still the product of God's intervention, just meaning that they're part of God's ways of working in the world, his secondary causes, are viewed as inferior versions of the original plan. Right. Somehow there is an original plan. Here's the original design of organisms. And then there is, oh, well, after creation. Well, we know there's this fall, which, uh, you know, creates uh, degradation of the, the, the creation by most by most creationist um, reckoning are viewed as an inferior version of the uh, tr of the original plan. True design occurred at creation devolved post-flood organisms are the result of the curse and like an overcopied book lack their original genetic glory as such they don't constitute true design this is great language i, I love this language i'm definitely going to use it in the future right it, it the, the the curse is like an overcopied book such that no organism alive today can have their true genetic glory right they're not they don't have their true perfected genome. And I just, again, talked about this when I talked about genetic entropy uh, and young earth creationists, that they view that the world is all running down, right? It, 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 everything is getting worse. It's decaying. And so nothing constitutes true design. So continuing at the bottom of the page here, yet such a dichotomy is counterintuitive. Many creationists believe that defensive mechanisms came into existence after the fall, thorns and thistles for example, All right? You shall bring forth. Some defensive systems, like that of the bombardier beetle, are truly remarkable, defying any simplistic notion of degeneration of, or degenerate genetic mutations. This is a great observation, a great observation. Like, you know, where did thorns and thistles come from and other, uh, you, know, cr you know, other mechanisms, well, like sharp teeth and spines and all kinds of things on animals that help them defend themselves in a world that now has death where it didn't before and they didn't need those mechanisms. Creationists often kind of place those as being, uh, you know, sometimes like degenerate products of, of mutations and so forth from the original perfect creation. But he's saying this, you know, really incredible design of something like the bombardier beetle which seems so intricate that many creationists have pointed to it as an example of irreducible complexity like this could only have been created by a designer well where did that design come from if everything is decaying after the fall after the creation right if everything is falling apart if they don't have the original perfect genome and they've copied that book and made mistakes, how do they build something so amazing as some of these amazing defensive systems? Then he goes on and says, well, then there's also horse evolution. Many young earth creationists accept that our modern horse evolved from smaller multi-toed ancestor. To argue with that Equus is more deficient than say Myohippus, which is the, the fossil uh, ancestor of horses is to underappreciate the wonder of modern horse hooves, teeth, body size, build, speed, endurance, etc., over that of the Mesohippus, which had three toes, was smaller and a lighter build. That's not to say that Meohippus didn't have its niche, right? That it didn't survive as a species where it lived at the time, and it had purposes and design. But it's perfectly fine for God, but it's perfectly fine for God to have used secondary means to bring about the single-toed equus. All right, so Yes, uh, somehow you have equus and you have bombardier beetles, which have what appear to almost be more perfect design or at least exceptionally good design for the modern world. They don't just look like rundown products 
uh, of, of a long lineage of decay. And so how do we explain this? Creationist, uh, that's you know, what, what Ken Colson is saying. He's saying that we, 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 we are living in this dichotomy where we're saying things are decaying, but then we're also building up and, uh, and uh, loving on these uh, really complicated and amazing designs that are in nature. All right, so now we get to this mediated design thing. Wood and Murray in 2003 proposed that God's design should not be limited to, God, to the creation week, but should be extended to post-fall biological complexity. Their model, called mediated design, is important and accounts for the complexity of the bombardier beetle's defensive mechanisms, as well as the modern horse's hoof. Um, only God's mediated design can account for the existence of these complex organisms, uh, organs and systems of organs. organs. So you're asking, well, what exactly is this mediated design? Um, it's saying things look like they have extra design after the creation week, like they've gotten new designs. And so therefore, there must be some mechanism for these designs. And that mechanism isn't just going to come from reshuffling genes, which is a ran seemingly a random operation. Uh, and natural selection, all these other things, which can only select on the things that were there before in the genome. So let's see, what is the mechanism? <laughs> Mediated design seeks to embrace these as yet unknown mechanisms. Oh, so there you have it. There's some unknown mechanism we have yet to discover. And that's what Wood talks about this. I mean, that that there must be additional mechanisms. In other words, the mechanisms we see today that have been described by evolutionary biologists for how, uh, how design comes about, how adaptations come about, is another way of putting it, are insufficient for explaining the organisms we have today. They find them not to be sufficient to explain all the, the amazing properties of organisms, especially within the framework of a limited amount of time to do it in. All right, so this hyper evolution after the fall uh, can't be accounted for just by the mechanisms that we know about today from the evolutionary literature. There must be something else out there. Mediated design, somehow God's is in there working and helping the design process in a way that we haven't discovered yet. I think that Wood and others would say is discoverable because they think it's not going to be a mystical force. I don't think he's not proposing this is some mystical force. This is uh, God's hand that we can't see. He's saying this is still secondary causes, something that God has built into the world that that al allows him to to work through, you know, and create these designs after the fall, after the creation, and continue to explore new and more wonderful designs as time goes forward versus just everything decaying and falling apart and becoming less fit in this world as some creationists are prone to think. Um, so, but it's an unknown mechanism. Natural selection doesn't work uh, to confer minor, does work to confer minor variations, but as science progresses, especially in the area that relates to genetics, this simple Darwinian mechanism no longer seems tenable um, given the complex biological change. And then down here, highlighted again, unfortunately, some creationists think that conceding to mediated design will necessarily lead to full-bone Darwinian evolution. Now, even though they don't have a mechanism, as I was saying before, they think that this will be yet another mechanism. So like we got natural selection, genetic drift, uh, mutations, uh, gene flow, and then X, right? Mediated design, some other mechanism. Uh, but being just another mechanism that allows for organisms to adapt and change and speciate sounds just like another support mechanism for evolutionary biology. After all, where does one draw the line? This kind of reasoning, however, is unwarranted. Um, where do you draw the line? Well, see, that that is the question, right? How? If organisms are allowed to continue to change and they have this mediated design mechanism that allows them to continue to explore new environments and come up with new amazing abilities to adapt to them, isn't there a danger they could adapt and change themselves right out of being a kind into another kind of organism? That's, that's the thing that 
um, he's recognizing that other creationists will fear uh, if they accept this idea that there is an additional property that can overcome genetic decay and actually create greater designs, right? Not just destroy design. All right, so I, I just find, um, I, I find Coulson's uh, writing really fascinating and the way he, he uh, interlinks different ideas of creationists together in new and novel ways. Um, he does get blamed for being, you know, capitulating to, to evolutionary biology and old earth uh, ideas, but he's a realist in the sense that he sees the problems. Um, and he's trying to find new creative solutions. He thinks media design has not been really given its due. And of course, not having a mechanism makes it hard to really test. But, you know, nonetheless, um, as an idea, um, he's right. Young Earth creationists need another idea like that. and They need to explore it. Uh, lastly, he does refer in this article to the fact that he, he suggests that Although the bombardier beetle um, is an amazing design and somehow its design is mediated in post, uh, post fall events, um, he goes on and he tries to say that evolutionary biologists have yet to really explain it and it's still just totally amazing. And so God must be involved in that process uh, somehow. So it's still intelligent design. Um, but, you know, there are. There are actually quite a few models for the bombardier beetle and how it's been formed. And I would just uh, encourage you to I'll put a link to my um, I'll put a link to my video about the bombardier beetle and some of the ways that uh, the bombardier beetle challenges some of the classification methods of young earth creationists. And so I'll allow that to, to talk a lot more about bombardier beetles, which are really cool insects. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for this week. I say that's it. There's a whole lot of other stuff, but I can't pack it all in. I'm already like over my usual time limit that I give myself to talk about this week in creationism. So hopefully next week is a slow week and I can go back and kind of fill in with some other items that uh, I had to skip over uh, for this particular episode of this week in creationism. So thanks for uh, hanging in there with me, and um, I, I appreciate uh, if you uh, hit that like button and um, follow me if you want to find out what happens in creationism next week. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.